are blessed with an outstanding scientific advisory board. It's chaired by uh, Nick Sakamano. Some of us knew Nick when he worked at Pfizer uh, some years ago. Nick left Pfizer, I won't guess how many years, but seven or eight years, and, and went to Array Pharmaceuticals, uh, which is a uh, uh, looking for uh, you know, treatments to, for cancer. They were in the news on Monday uh, because uh, Pfizer, of all companies, bought Array for $11 billion. Now, as much as we all love Nick, I'm not sure he's worth the price. <laughs> but, in fact, Nick and some other Pfizer researchers, as well as his whole organization in Boulder, Colorado, have come up with so many new uh, promising uh, oncology treatments, uh, as well as a combination of colon cancer that's already in the market that Pfizer saw uh, fit to not only buy them, but they're going to keep them in oper operation. That's the chair of our scientific advisory board. Uh, also on the scientific advisory board is another scientist that you next vice you might know, uh, Mike Marin, who is the chief scientific officer of immune, uh, uh, immuno uh, uh, biotech in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and they've come up with a very exciting platform to discover multiple new uh, uh, targets for treating uh, all types of cancers, including breast cancer. But that's the discovery side. Then we are on the development side, and, and we are blessed uh, with two people who are actually here tonight, both Susan Logan and Michael Garabedian, both practicing oncologists and, and very knowledgeable in this field. And so I will sit, so we get, Michael will probably talk a little bit about this, we get uh, about 25 or so proposals every year, and I'm, I'm part of the conversations, and I just sit there in awe, because you have people who are an expert in this field from the earliest stages of idea generation to actual clinical practice. And this, and I'm not saying this just because, it, this group of, of advisors we have on the scientific advisory board are as good as any review board for any oncology programs in this country, and I would include the National Institutes of Health and the NCI as part of this. They are outstanding. They know researchers at these places. They know cutting edge research. They know where the, uh, the treatments are going. And they're the ones who are deciding what grants the fund? And it, it's just, it's wonderful to see. And we need some decision making because we get a bunch of, of proposals every year. We can't fund them all. Now, we did four last year, we did four next this year, I believe, and that's wonderful. But without these people, you could sort of be a flail in the So, um, uh, we have Michael uh, tonight who's going to talk to a little bit about uh, the process. <laughs> and uh, uh, Michael, really thrilled to have you. It's true. Much. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Garabedian. I'm a faculty member at NYU School of Medicine. I do basic research. I do basic research in uh, yes, oncology. But of course, I'm also better known as Susan Logan's husband, <laughs> uh, Max Logan's uncle, <laughs> Stephen and Jean Logan, and Michael and Norma Logan's brother-in-law. <laughs> so I, I have a, a personal connection to the foundation. So I first met Norma when Susan and I were dating actually back in 1982, uh, a long time. Uh, and I think about Norma every day, and I miss her every day. And as you heard, the foundation, I think Norma's vision and Sandy's vision of uh, having a foundation that raises money, that 100% of it goes to, the re to research, is, is really astounding. They don't want the money going to overhead. They don't want it to go to me. They don't want it going to uh, the food. You need volunteers. You need other people to help step up because the walkers that you raise money, you want it to go to research. And I'm going to here today to try to talk to you about what does that mean? What does it mean to raise money for research? What, what, what does that mean for you? And, sorry, I'm <laughs> and so what, what's all your hard work and all the tired feet from walking accomplished towards curing breast cancer? And I know you've heard at past meetings some of the recipients of the research uh, talking about the research and, uh, and the dollars that they've used from the dollars you've raised. But this year we thought we'd give you a little sense of what the um, scientific, how we select the individuals for those uh, awards. So as I said, I'm a scientist and a basic researcher, and my goal here is to really convince you uh, that you all are at the forefront of cancer research. Raising money to fund, fund these young researchers, 
uh, you're all investing in the future cure of breast cancer. And, and as we heard, these are young, young researchers that are at, really at the prime. They're, 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 they're young, they're exciting, they're, they're smart, uh, passionate, dedicated uh, towards curing breast cancer. Uh, you hear a lot of, in the news about cancer in general, breast cancer as well, uh, but there is some good news. I mean, if you look, statistics, cancer rates are falling, and they have been from, in, uh, from 2007 on, so they're getting fewer. And also, um, and for instance, even for breast cancer, the five-year survival rate is up to 90%, so uh, there, there is hope, and things are getting better. Um, so a long way to go, but things, there is some good news. So why is that? So why are things getting a little bit better? And I think there's really two main reasons, and I'll try to articulate those a little bit. Um, one is that there's better screening, so we can tell the cancer earlier now than we used to, and that's a great thing, because if you catch it early, you can get rid of it. And then the other thing is we have more therapeutic options. We understand, because of the research, we understand how the cancer is wired and how it works. So for example, as you've probably heard in the news, there's been a lot of talk about genomics or genetics or however you want to think about it. But really, it's, it's asking a very simple question, and that's what scientists do. We ask kind of simple questions. In fact, all you are, are equally into probably scientists. You're just curious about things, like why is a tumor cell different than a normal cell? So why is a breast cancer cell a breast cancer cell, a normal breast cell, a normal breast cell? What makes them different? And so now we understand that. We have the whole blueprint of the tumor cell, and we have the whole blueprint of the, of the normal cell. And there are a lot of differences, not surprisingly. Um, the, the challenge was, of course, figuring out which differences matter. So it's a, li a little like looking at your house and seeing a big beam across and wondering if that beam is really the load-bearing beam or not. And if you took it down, the whole thing would crash versus some decorative beam, right? We want to find the load-bearing beam. We want to find that Achilles heel in the cancer cell so we can have it crash down on itself, so we can cut it out, break it down, and have it uh, come down. And so uh, it's taking a little bit of time to figure out what those things are, those important, uh, what we call drivers of cancer, the things that are really promoting the, the cancers. And when we know the relevant changes, when we know those things that are really uh, important, we can go after them, and that's what the pharmaceutical industry is great at. If you know the target, they're really quite good at hitting the targets. And we know many more targets, and, and since uh, uh, you know, the early days, when uh, even in the case of Norma, you know, there, there's been great strides in, in understanding and, and targeting breast cancer. And it works, and that's part of the reason why we're seeing uh, the, the rates of cancer in general going down and, and the survival rates going down. And another area that John alluded to is, 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 is something called immune oncology. You might have heard again of this in the news. And it's uh, the idea of having your immune system fight off the cancer. So trying to utilize our own our immune system to attack the cancer. And our immune system is a really wonderful thing. I mean, it, it's, it's complicated, but it's, it keeps us safe from all kinds of infections and keeps us, uh, battles things that are not like us, basically. Um, and so it was realized way back when, even when I was a graduate student a thousand years ago, that, you know, why, you know, we know the tumor cells are different, why isn't our immune system just taking care of it, you know? And, and it took a long time to realize that there's, uh, it's, it's complicated, it's, it's probably an excuse that a lot of scientists use, but in fact, uh, we didn't understand the immune system. There's, there's uh, things that um, activate the immune system, like a gas pedal, there are things that inhibit the immune systems, like a brake on a car, we didn't really understand the relationships, and decades of, of work from, from dozens and dozens of researchers really cracked the identity of the immune system, and that's been harnessed so we can now take the brakes off when we need it and have the immune system attack the tumor. And the, and the good news is that when it works, it works really well. So they get really robust responses, and, and the tumors often, you know, and, and untreatable cancers often will go away. It doesn't work for everyone. They're trying to figure out why it only works for some and not others, but that we'll, we'll get there. Um, so really this kind of uh, you know, long-range thinking and planning and working in the scientific community has really led to these breakthroughs and that leads to, to better outcomes for patients and also um, you know, longer survival times. So I'll talk a little bit about how we select our, our recipients for the grants. Um, and these are the people that you fund, that are funding for the future of, of this cancer research. And again, as you heard before, they're early stage, mid-stage investigators that 
uh, are really at the cusp and at the height of, of their scientific prowess and are able to really do remarkable things. Um, and so, as, as John mentioned, there's a scientific advisory board that Nick is the head of, Mike Moran, Susan Logan, and myself, and John. And I think, again, the thing that's unique about the foundation is that we request applications from the top cancer research uh, areas, institutes in the, in the Northeast, typically. And so we get wonderful people from Dana-Farber, we get people from Mass General, we get people from NYU, we get people from um, University of Pennsylvania, we get you know, people from Conn College, I mean, you, you name it, we get the best. And, uh, and so the board, so that's that local kind of uh, grassroots funding of local uh, cancer research groups is important. But also, as John alluded to, we have a scientific board that has both basic scientists like Susan and myself who are into discovery. I mean, so what basic science does is we identify new things. We identify uh, areas that hadn't been identified before, and we uh, try to, you know, develop those into potential therapeutic targets for then companies such as Pfizer or other drug companies to come in and develop drugs against those. And so Susan and I have the basic understanding of the kind of cutting edge cancer research that's going on. And uh, Nick and Mike come from the pharmaceutical side and they understand how to, can this thing actually be promoted or, or moved into a more clinical area that could eventually lead to a cure or, or, uh, or help in the breast cancer area. So as John pointed out, we, we, there, it, it's really an impressive group of individuals. I'm not, not necessarily myself, but the rest of the group is, and we uh, um, have very high standards, and we've all done this for since the, the get-go, so we've been doing it for 13 years, so we know each other quite well and understand uh, what what is uh, what's really good science. And so we do get a bunch of applications. It's always a little uh, scary when the email comes that here are the applications, because it you get 25 or so, and we read, everybody reads all of them. So we have you know, eight pages and lots of information that you have to go through. It takes, you know, it takes time, but it's worth it. And then we score them. We, each of us has our own score sheet, and we rank them for creativity and the, uh, kind of the science behind it and the applicant. And so we come to a score. And then we get on the phone, and through a conference call, we all discuss them. We kind of rank, and we share each other's opinions. To, to the group, and we come to consensus of, of maybe about, you know, we're going to fund four, we pick about four or five, five to six, maybe one or two more that we're going to uh, potentially fund. And then I think the other thing that's really quite unique, and, and this is a really testament to Nick, he actually calls every applicant that makes the cut, so out of these five or six, and interviews them on the phone. And that really gets to the heart of how passionate they are in their research, how much they really Understand. Someone might look great on paper and have all these wonderful accomplishments, but when they when push comes to shove, when he's talking to them and asking questions, they don't really understand what they're doing, and uh, or vice versa. There may be someone that maybe didn't look so great on paper, but when you talk to them, they blow your socks off, and that's a really an important component to the you know, to the selection process. Um, and so, uh, so what did you guys choose? So I'm, I'm using you all because you really are the the, the people that make this all possible. I mean, we. Got the fun part of really getting to look at all the great science and great, you know, trying to understand and, and pick the best ones. But um, so one of the things that you chose was, uh, as we alluded to, that, that cancer cells are a little bit different, as I pointed out, than the normal cells. And actually, the food they eat is different. So they have a different metabolism. They ingest different things and they run off different fuels. And so the idea is that um, if you can identify what those foods are, what those fuels are, can try to starve the cancer cell. And since it's not used uh, by the normal cell, it doesn't hurt the normal cells. So that's one area that we're funding. And that, of course, it's going to take a while for that to translate into the clinic, but it's a really interesting idea and it's a new way to come in and attack the tumors that haven't been thought of before. And another scientist we funded, not at Dana Farber, but was interested in understanding why some breast cancer uh, patients remain free of breast cancer for, for years, even decades. And then, uh, then it comes back. And uh, so it turns out that there are cancer cells that remain dormant. They're kind of like hibernating, you know, bears, and, and they don't, they, they wake up. And they aren't killed by the drugs initially. And they sit there dormant for years, and then somehow they come back. And again, the question that, from a research point of view, is why? And we have really no idea. But it's a problem, and that can be something that we're trying to get at. So one of the researchers 
has, has ways of trying to understand this. Um, so she's trying to understand what signals wake up the dormant cells, what, what are just like an hibernation, you know, spring comes and the bear wakes up. So why do these cells wake up? What's the, what are the signals that may invoke that? And so if we knew that, of course, we could go in and try to block those signals so the cells would come back again or wake up. Or if they do wake up, can we figure out new ways to, to try to kill them? So can we keep them dormant? Or can, once they wake up, can we find uh, better ways to kill them? And so that's kind of this new work that's going on. This is work that you guys have funded. Um, and I know at times it probably seems like cancer is winning. Uh, we've all had stories of people that we love that have been afflicted with cancer. Uh, but I think there's hope. We're understanding more and more about how to attack the tumors in more precise ways and in more durable ways so it lasts longer, fewer side effects. And we understand how to harness our body's immune system to kill the tumors. And I think that's going to be a huge game changer moving forward. But we still need to invest in the future, and that's where you know, our key. And, um, and again, it's research that drives medicine. It's the research behind it. I mean, the oncologists, the physicians are fabulous. They do amazing work. But it's really the basic research that you guys are funding through your, your efforts that are making the difference. It takes a long time, unfortunately, but it's the uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great system, and you got, and uh, the, the walkers that. Uh, researchers that you funded through your efforts are really going to really the future. Um, so, and again, I think all this work will ultimately lead to the eradication of breast cancer. It takes some time, but know that uh, all of you are part of the cure. So, <laughs>